Okay, so uh, we have seen that uh, in the statics course, uh, equilibrium of rigid bodies, so non deformable structures. And in that case, we mainly focus on the external loads, forces, and moments, and distributed loads. Of course, uh, <clears throat> within the frame of this course, uh, we will focus on deformable structures. So what's a deformable structure or what's deformation and what is the origin of deformation? Uh, we know that each material is made of atoms. So somehow they are connected to each other. You can think that they are rigid balls connected with springs. And of course, when you apply a force to each uh, rigid spheres so, or atoms, if you pull them, they will fall apart, and the distance between the two atoms will increase. Or if you push them, they will get shorter. And in fact, when we have a structure, uh, well, let me try to find something. Okay. So if we have a structure, again, as is the case here. So I applied forces with my hands, you see, and it's bended. Now the point is this, when they are bended, when this steel ruler is bended, if you think that this beam is made of strings, some of the strings are, uh, will get shortened, will be shortened and the others one uh, the others will be uh, elongated. So the distance between the atoms will be elongated and the distance between the, the atoms uh, will get shorter. In fact, they attract or repel each other. Now, this is the focus of this course. So we will uh, focus on the formable structures. Certainly, this basically means that we need a measure between the force and the formation. Okay, now let's return back to the uh, statics and let's begin from the force. Now, in fact, we have external loads here, F1, F2, uh, F3, F4 are external loads. And this is our uh, structure. So what we mean by structure? So structure is, um, has a material inside and it has a certain geometry. So this is what the structure is. So when the Geometry chains, even if you have the same material inside it, the structure will be different. So this is one thing that we need to know. And in fact, uh, remember that we uh, always consider uh, static equilibrium in the statics course. So what was static, uh, static equilibrium? So some of the forces equal to zero. Static equilibrium simply means that either the object is motionless or it has a constant velocity. So there is no acceleration. It will be the same for strength of material. So we, within the frame of this course, we will always uh, consider uh, static equilibrium. So the sum of the external loads has to be equal to zero. Some of the forces has to be equal to zero and some of the moments has to be equal to zero. Now, just assume that we can cut the structure at an arbitrary location. Certainly the cut section has to be in static equilibrium too. We have seen it. When we analyze the thrust system with a method of section, we use this approach. 
also uh, when we want to draw when we draw the uh, moment and bending force or uh, force diagrams shear force diagrams and uh, normal force diagrams we use this approach so wherever we cut the structure there is a tangential force which is a shear force there will be a moment acting at that section which is a bending moment and there will be a normal force which is normal to the cut of the surface we denote the normal force generally with n and shear force with v and moment with m again this piece has to be in static equilibrium okay So when we cut the structure in 3D, it is the same. We have an arbitrary force, which is the resultant force acting on that surface. And there is a moment acting on that surface. Again, in three-dimensional structures, the structure has to be in static equilibrium wherever we cut, the, doesn't matter where, uh, where we cut the structure. Okay, let's go further and uh, let's analyze the uh, problem. Now, indeed, using the force directly will, uh, may lead to some uh, misconceptions. And we need another measure for this. Uh, we generally use uh, differentiation or infinitely small pieces when you want to analyze the engineering system because we need a mathematical model and uh, uh, in order to solve our problem. Now, again, let's assume that we have a three-dimensional structure and we cut it from the surface. And let's assume that we have a, a plane surface. Indeed, it, and we focus on a point, on the surface, we see that there exists a resultant force. In fact, these resultant forces may uh, have an arbitrary direction. So let's choose an arbitrary uh, surface delta A, which is infinitely small, very small. But what is very small? Uh, from mechanics point of view. So remember that we have atoms. And in between atoms, there is nothing. So what shall be the scale of this infinitely small area? Now, just assume that you have two atoms and you travel your finger over the atoms. So you feel the atom and then you feel nothing. And then you, again, you will feel the atom. Now, if you go back a little bit, so just um, for an understanding, for you to better understand the problem, we know that the average distance between two atoms uh, is three angstroms. So what is three angstroms? Three 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. So we are not capable of seeing with the, uh, with the naked eye. Okay. Now, if your finger is smaller than three angstrom, you will feel the spaces between the atoms. Now, just imagine that your finger is one nanometer uh, long. So you can feel one nanometer distance. So one nanometer is one 10 to the power uh, minus nine meters. Then when you travel your finger over the atoms, you will feel little uh, wiggles, so like this. Okay, now just imagine that, now the width of your finger is 10 nanometers. Now it's going to be like this. If you travel your finger over the atoms, this is what you're going to see. 
if it is 10 nanometers. As you see, as the width of my finger increases, I begin to uh, feel the atoms uh, as little perturbations, little uh, obstacles. If it is 100 nanometers, then you will not see anything. So you will assume you will see that you will not notice the atoms. So you will think that you are traveling your finger over a flat surface. So basically, we can say that this is the length scale because here, as you go from this scale to this scale, so remember that this is one nanometer, this is 10 nanometers, and this is 100 nanometers. Approximately, I'm talking about uh, uh, a length scale of uh, roughly uh, about the length scales. So basically, uh, you will not notice the atoms. So therefore, this is the length scale that we consider uh, as continuous, so the structure is continuous. Now I can use the tools given by the classical calculus. And we generally use derivatives and uh, integrals, and we always assume that functions are continuous and so forth. So now this is the length scale. So this is the edge length of the delta A. I can say that, roughly speaking just to give an idea, physical background. Okay. So now I have a very small area and I just take out this infinitely small area and magnify it and look at the forces on it. Now the resultant force on it is Delta F. So remember that some of these forces will give me the force that acts on the surface, on this section. Now, certainly this force delta half has three components in each direction. Now I put my reference coordinate in a manner that X and Y axis are in plane and Z is normal to the surface. Now I have three components of the force, certainly delta Fx, delta Fy, and delta Fz. So two of the forces are tangent to the surface and one is normal to the surface. Identically, I can make another cut, which is perpendicular to this surface. Now I have two surfaces which are perpendicular to each other, and I have again three forces on the surface. Okay. Now I have something new here uh, stress. So remember that force is a quantity. And we all know that we are making a simple tension test in order to characterize, determine the material properties. I can choose different specimen geometries, but I know that the material property is independent, has to be independent of the geometry. Remember that when we combine the geometry with the material property, it becomes a structure. In fact, I can apply the same force to one structure. And if I change the geometry and apply the same force, certainly the response will be different. But I just want to determine the uh, material properties. How can I do that? Now, for this purpose, what I do is I normalize the force with the area. So what I do is I divide the force to the area. Now, 
certainly this basically means that I'm calculating the force per unit area. And in fact, this is the stress. So the stress is the force per unit area. Now, here is the point. Remember that the tangential forces are shearing forces, shear forces, and the normal one will try to elongate the structure. So this is what I know. Therefore, identically, I can name the stresses as normal stress, which I denote by sigma, and the shear stress, which I denote by tau. So these are the two. Stresses. So these forces generate shear stresses, and the normal one will generate the normal stress on a surface. Therefore, I have three stress components on each uh, unit surface. Again, in order to analyze the structure, what I do is I just take a unit cube, which is infinitely small. And of course, Remember that I have three stress components acting on each surface, and my cube has six faces. Therefore, this basically means that I have 18 stresses acting on a unit cube. Okay, now this is my unit cube, magnified unit cube. And uh, this is how I show the stresses on the unit cube. So remember that the sigma is uh, used to uh, show the uh, normal stress components and tau is used for the shear stress components. Now, in case of a normal stress, I just put the axis which is normal to the surface. Sometimes it can be shown as sigma xx. There are different uh, notations. Uh, at the moment, we will use sigma for the normal stress component and tau for the shear stress component. So the shear stresses, remember that are tangential to the surface and sigma or normal stress is normal to the surface. So the substrate here shows me here, for example, x shows me the normal of the surface. So when I look at this surface, it's normal is x-axis, therefore it is sigma x. How about the shear stresses? Now I have two subscripts here. So the first subscript shows me the normal of the surface. Here the surface has a normal of x, therefore tau x and tau x. And second subscript shows me the direction of the shear stress. So this shear stress is in the direction of z axis. As a result, this is tau xz. And this subscript is in the direction of y, therefore it is tau xy. Now, when I look at this surface, it's normal is z axis. As a result, the normal stress is denoted by sigma z. Now, I have again two shear stresses. Now, first index shows me the normal of the surface. Therefore, this is tau z and this is tau z as well. And in fact, the second substrate shows me the direction of the shear stress. Therefore, this is tau z x and this is tau z y. Since this shear stress is in the direction of y, 
and this shear stress is in the direction of x. It is the same for this surface, so which has a normal of y axis. Again, we have sigma y, normal stress. Tau y z is the shear stress in the z direction, and tau y x is the shear stress in the x direction. Okay, we have just talked about it, but let's uh, consider a simple tension specimen. So we have a simple bar with a certain cross section. Of course, the cylindrical geometry has some advantages because it has a symmetry, tangential symmetry. And let's assume that we apply a force to this specimen from both ends. Okay, now when we cut the structure, we will have some normal force distribution. In fact, it may not be uniform. So it is non uniform. Now, here comes the average stress. So remember that. P is a point force here. So this is the total force which acts at that cross section. And whenever we cut the wherever we cut the structure, we have a resultant normal force. And some of these normal forces, infinitely small normal forces, will give us the resultant normal force. Therefore, what we do is we integrate these normal forces over this. Cross section. Okay. This will give us the resultant force. In fact, remember that stress at a point is equal to force divided by the area. If we just take a unit, infinitely small area on this section at an arbitrary location. So the normal force that at that location has to be equal to stress sigma multiplied by the area, infinitely small area. If we substitute it into our expression, this will give us that integration of the stress over the area has to give us the total resultant force. From here, we can easily say that average stress sigma. So this basically means that we assume that stress is constant and uniform over the cross section. Has to be equal to normal force divided by the total area. This is what we generally uh, assume for one dimensional problems. Okay. Now, remember that we have a unit cube. And we always, within the frame of this course, we assume that structures are in static equilibrium. Therefore, if we take out a unit cube inside a structure, it has to be in static equilibrium too. Now, let's look at our unit cube. So it has a surface area of delta A. In fact, if we write the static equilibrium in Z direction, for example, and if we assume that the normal stress is sigma on one side and sigma prime on the other side, so the areas on both sides Uh, is uh, our delta A. So sigma multiplied by delta A will give us the normal force here. And the sigma prime multiplied by delta A will give us the normal force on the other surface. And since their direction are opposite, it's minus. So 
this operation, must be equal to zero. So sigma multiplied by delta A minus sigma prime multiplied by delta A has to be equal to zero. This basically means that sigma is equal to sigma prime. It is the same for the other axis. And it is the same for the shear stresses as well. Now remember that we have three stress components on each face and we have six faces. So in total, we have 18. If the opposite faces have the same values of the stresses, now this basically means that we have nine stress components acting on a unit Q when the structure is in static equilibrium. Okay, now this is not the only case, of course. So we, do, uh, we don't try to elongate the structure, but sometimes we try to cut the structure. So how do we cut the structure? So here's an example. So we have blocks B and D, and we have uh, the piece uh, A, and if we apply a force F to the center, Certainly, there will be some reaction force at points B and D, uh, which will be in uh, opposite direction. As a result, the central piece of this structure will uh, be cut by the force F. So this will result in two shear forces. So as we see here, for example, this is the central piece. Okay, we have the force F. If we draw the free body diagram of the this piece, we have two shear forces, V and V. So again, two V has to be equal to F. In fact, again, we can assume that the shear stress is uniform over this surface. Therefore, we have the average shear stress, which is V divided by this area. We are going to see that the shear stress is not uniform, of course. But assuming that the shear stress is uniform is not a bad approximation as well. Okay. Again, we can take out the unit cube and look at the shear stresses. So here, for example, we have tau yz. Okay. So the shear stress uh, on a surface which has a normal direction of y and in the direction of z. And if you look at the other surface, again, this is tau zy. Therefore, this stress component is on a surface which has a normal direction of z and it is in the direction of y. Now, Again, the resultant force of this shear stress is shear stress multiplied by the area, identically this shear stress generates this force. So we have a unit cube. This basically means that delta x is equal to delta z and delta y. That's okay. But it gives us an another. Uh, so it helps us in simplifying our uh, stress stresses. So remember that static equilibrium has two conditions. First one is sum of the forces has to be equal to zero. Now, the second one is sum of the moments has to be equal to zero. If we write the moment with respect to any point, so arbitrary location, let's say that this point, 
And if you calculate the moments, of these forces. And if we sum them up, we will see that uh, they have to be uh, equal to this, zero. Now, this basically means that Tau Zx is equal to tau Yz. Therefore, this unit cube cannot rotate. But the moment generated by this force has to be equal to moment generated by this. Since I can choose an arbitrary location, I can choose the center of the cube, of course, as the reference point. Therefore, all the moment arms will be equal. As a result, the moment generated by these forces will be equal for simplification. So this is this reduces the number of stress quantities that we need to calculate in three-dimensional space to six. Okay. Now remember that we are not talking about uh, rigid structures. So rigid means non-deformable. And in fact, we are talking about the deformable structures made of atoms. And if we apply a force, we know that it elongates. So how can we measure the elongation? So we use stress as a, non uh, as a normalized quantity, which is independent of the geometry, let's say, some sort of independence. Uh, we need another quantity for the deformation, you apply the same force to a one meter long wire, for example, it elongates one centimeter. And if you apply the same force to the two meters, and if you measure it, you see that the total elongation is two centimeters then. But we need an, another quantity, which uh, we basically uh, establish a relationship, uh, some sort of independent of geometry. And that comes, uh, this is what we call strain. Remember that how we measure it. So we normalize the force with the area. What we do is we measure the initial length. We can easily measure it, of course. Then we look at the total amount of elongation, delta. Then what we do is we divide the total amount of elongation into the original length, L0. So if the final length is L, the total elongation is equal to L minus L0. If we divide it with the L0, we have the average strain. This is what we call strain. Now, if you're, you have the same force, okay? And just imagine that you have a two meters long wire. Let's say that's steel wire. And you have two centimeters of elongation. This will give you a strain of 0 0.01. You apply the same force. So this one meter long of steel wire made of the same material. And you see that the elongation is one centimeters. And again, the strain will be 0 0.01. As we see, now the strain quantity under the same force, if the cross section is the same, 
is independent of the length of the wire. Now we can use it for engineering purposes. Of course, this is called normal strain. Uh, we have in another force, remember that shear force and what the shear force was, we apply a tangential force V. Now, when you apply a tangential force, you see that, and if the other surface of the object is fixed, you see that it deforms and there is a change in angle. Now, in this case, the strain is called the shear strain. So here is the normal strain, here is the shear strain, and it's about the change of angle. If you measure the change of angle, the total final angle, just assume that you have a rectangular shape uh, object, you apply V, and again, the structure will be parallel pipes. So the shear stress will be P divided by two minus theta. So this angle is the shear stress, shear strain, sorry. So this is what the strain is. And in fact, there's a relationship between stress and strain. So there is a relationship between the applied force and the deformation, and that is the material property. Now, how we measure the material property? I think we all know uh, universal tension test. What they do is, in the simplest case, we have a rigid frame machine, okay? So very uh, almost non-deformable structure. Then we put a piece inside it and we apply a force and we pull it and we measure the deformation somehow. Possibly we use a strain gauge. Uh, strain gauge is a sensor which has uh, some wires on it and as you apply it for it is uh, glued to the surface of the specimen as the specimen deforms the wires will elongate so the resistance change and we measure the change in resistance simply uh, so this is what the strain gauge is and on the other side we measure the applied force and we have a graph of uh, applied force versus elongation. Now, here, as you know, uh, we prefer cylindrical specimens. Generally, the, the uh, length of the specimen is 20 times the radius of the specimen in order to have a uniform uh, deformation at the center. Because due to the geometric change, there are some non-uniformities in the stress and in the deformation also. Okay, so we make a simple tension compression test and we have different regions. If you have uh, uh, for example, material. So let's say that generally we use steel. Okay. In the initial stage, as you increase the force, you see that the strain, the ratio between the stress and strain is almost linear. So as you increase the stress or force, you see that the deformation increases linearly. So this region is called elastic region. Then we reach to a region where um, the 
the stress almost doesn't uh, increase anymore. So we apply the force, but material begin to flow. So we see that there's an elongation, but we do not see any increase in this stress. Okay, if you go further, if you continue to deform the structure, you see that there is a increase in the stress with the deformation. So this region, this is called strain hardening, basically. We will talk about uh, this stress. So this is the yield stress where the material begin to flow. Here again, material continue to flow, but of course, the stress increases. Then you reach the maximum in the stress. This is called ultimate stress. This is the maximum stress that you can achieve. Then you begin to see a necking and then the fails, the material fails. Now, there are two different stresses and strains. One is called engineering stress and strain, and the other one is called uh, true stress and strain. So what is the difference? So remember that in order to calculate the force uh, stress, we divide the force to the unit area. Now, as the structure deforms, certainly this unit area will change. Therefore, which area we are going to use? The undeformed one or the deformed one? So this is the difference between the true stress and the engineering stress basically. If you use the deformed area, area in the deformed structure, it is a true stress. If you use the area in the undeformed state, it is the engineering stress. Generally, in many calculations, for small deformations, it's okay. So the difference is negligible. But for when the deformation is large, of course, there is a difference. But we generally prefer to use uh, for simplicity. Uh, undeformed area because it's very easy to calculate. If you have a specimen, for example, tension specimen, you can easily calculate the initial area, right? You know the area. So from there, you can calculate the engineering stress. And uh, it is the same for the strain. If you divide the, remember that you normalize the elongation with the length of the specimen. If you use the initial length of the specimen that is engineering strain, if you use the current deformed length of the specimen, that is the true strain. Again, it is easy to measure the initial length, and therefore we generally use uh, engineering strain. And this, and again, for small deformations, the difference between the engineering stress and strain and the true stress and strain is almost negligible. But when you measure the true stress and true, uh, if you compare the engineering strain, stress and engineering strain, uh, sorry, true stress, you see that the true stress constantly increasing, increases, even though there is necking. So what is necking? What happens when the necking happens? So as you know, when you elongate the structure, the radius try to get smaller. And there is a certain limit. Somehow, the material uh, cannot flow in the tangential direction. So it's highly compressed in the tangential direction. And then begin to flow in the uh, direction of the specimen. And then you see that at a certain location, there is a sharp decrease 
in the uh, radius. This is what we call necking, uh, basically. And of course, when you exceed the, when the stress exceeds the uh, critical, critical stress, which we call yield stress, the deformation is called plastic. So the deformation is irreversible. Here is on the right hand side, we see different uh, stress strain values of different steels. You see that uh, we have the soft steel. So the strength is very small, structural steel is a little bit higher than that. We have the machine steel, we have hard steel, and we have spring steel, which is which has much higher carbon content. Now the point is this, what happens in the plastic region? Again, we know that when you increase the load, material deforms. And in this region, if you unload the structure, the material return back to its original shape. Direct. And there is a certain limit, which we have the yield stress. If you exceed this point, so you continue to increase the load again. And at a certain point, let's say that A prime, you remove the load. As a result, material is unloaded, so the stress becomes zero. But you see that there is a certain amount of permanent deformation. So this is the plastic deformation. In fact, here, strain value between O prime and this point is elastic deformation. Or this is the elastic strain basically, and this is the plastic strain. Now, we have some, uh, of course, in this case, we have some material properties. In the elastic region, the ratio between the stress sigma and strain is denoted by E, and it's called Young modulus. Young modulus or modulus of elasticity. And the generally denoted by E. Now, when you unload the structure at A prime, again, remember that if you turn back to O prime, if you load the structure, what's going to happen is material in the stress strain curve, material will follow the structure and the stress at point A prime will be the new yield stress. Okay, now what else? We have the young modulus, okay. But just think that you have a cylindrical specimen and you compress it. You will see that it will shorten, it will get shortened, and it will be extended in the lateral directions. Okay. Now we can easily calculate the longitudinal strain, which is delta divided by the 
original length. And the lateral strength uh, strain is delta prime. So the change in the radius divided by the radius. Now, we have a quantity which is called Poisson's ratio. Uh, Poisson's ratio and then it is denoted by nu. Basically, it is the negative of the ratio of the lateral strain to the longitudinal strain. For isotropic homogeneous materials, it varies between 0 0.5 to minus 1. Now, when the material is incompressible, so its volume doesn't change, it is 0 0.45, basically. So different materials have different Poisson's ratios. For example, glass has a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.2, 0 0.25. Many metals have a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.32 to 0 0.4, 0 0.37, the typical one. Um, so the materials like tissue or gels are generally incompressible. So the Poisson's ratio is very close to 0 0.5 for those types of, for those materials. Okay. Now we have the shear modulus of course, so remember that we have the normal stress and the ratio between the normal stress and normal strain is denoted by the Young modulus. And what if we have the shear stress? Then we have the G. So remember that tau is the shear stress and gamma is the shear strain and the ratio between them is called the shear modulus and denoted by G. So uh, for a linear elastic material, you only need two material properties. Uh, so basically, either you need to know the Young modulus and Poisson's ratio, Young modulus and shear modulus, and uh, or shear modulus and Poisson's ratio. So different combinations. And it's quite easy to uh, prove that there exists a relationship between the shear modulus and the uh, Young modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Here we see the relationship. So the shear modulus is equal to Young modulus divided by two multiplied by one plus the Poisson's ratio. Uh, 